Okay, and here we are once again. Hello, everybody. I know I haven't been as active as I've been meaning to be. Um, doing some changes up in my personal life. I'm going to go ahead and basically quit my current job and kind of coast by on some of the uh, money I've been getting for schooling. And hopefully I got a project and a job lined up in my new job, which will let me uh, go to a more regular schedule and I might have more time to do shit like this. Uh, anyway, so I, I keep coming up with, with all these ideas while I'm working on doing stuff, but I just don't really have the time. I got to start writing this shit down because I got a lot of things I really want to talk about, but I keep forgetting them. So one of the reasons I remember this one is because I got like a couple tabs open up here, and this is I think what I'm really going to uh, rail on about today. So uh, I don't remember where the fuck I found it. I was. <sighs> And I, I was on the Discord, I was doing a whole bunch of links, and then I clicked links, and I somehow found myself on this one website, which just, I'm just looking at it, and it's, it, it's, I don't, I don't really know how I found myself here. But, it's, eh. Alright, so, the site in question that I somehow found myself on was thegoodmenproject.com. And I think, like, again, I don't know how I got here, but I've been, I, I started, I looked through the first one article which I read, which was that men are supposed to solve problems, not complain about them. And the article kind of goes on about the virtue of complaining and why men don't necessarily do it and whatnot. And it's, it, it's talking about the whole thing. I mean, somebody in my position with my history. Um, kind of just going through this and really, there's, there is some truth to this, um, uh, th this one article about, you know, how complaining is usually like a sign that there's like a deeper issue lodged in there. And part of me having to come to terms with a lot of the trauma that's happened in my life, I kind of had to really dig deep so I could figure out what it is and... You know, Tom kind of asked me that one question that kind of triggered the whole thing, which um, uh, I mentioned how I wasn't. I mentioned in front of him how I don't really have a good relationship with my sire. I do not refer to him as um, my paternal parent in any sort of way, shape or form. He has effectively lost that honor and privilege with me. Um, but, you know, Tom, like, sat down at some point and said, you know, like, yo, we, we really need to have a conversation about that at some point and really figure out why it is that you dislike that. And I kind of maintain that one there. But when I was at work uh, later the night, I really kind of sat down on it and really uh, pushed at it. I, I don't really know why. I... I, I, I Maybe I just wanted to have an answer for him. But when it's like I complained about him a lot, but when I kind of sat down and kind of really dug in there and found the root of the problem, um, it honestly turned out that the root cause of my failed relationship with my sire goes deeper than even that. Like, I am fairly certain, like, this is the origin root of a lot of issues that I've been having in my personal life. And it's what has not necessarily allowed me to succeed as well. So, that's why I think there was some, there was some virtue to this, uh, this one, um, article about, you know, men aren't, aren't supposed to be solve problems, not complain about them. And it goes on to say that men should complain about problems. I think where the article gets it right is that as humans overall, we got to really kind of bore down to that issue that we're avoiding internally amongst ourselves and seek to uh, rectify that wound. 
Now, this is where I think the article gets it wrong and is just a load of nonsense, is that it basically just goes on to say, you know, oh, talk out your feelings and whatnot and do this. And real men are going to say, all right, now I know what the problem is. What am I going to do about it? And I think that's where I'm kind of at right now. Um, is that now I... I understand uh, the root flaw um, behind a lot of the trauma. And I have kind of gone into a bit of a depressive spiral up, uh, over it. I am starting to come back out of it. It's it's not starting to impact me as much as it first did. Like, when it first did, um, you know, I had real trouble finishing off the work. I was just tired. I just wanted to go home, curl up, and just go... Uh, just curl up in the bed and just cry for the next two weeks because it, 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 it just, when I realized what the issue was, I just felt so damn helpless. But it, eventually, you know, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, get on with your life and figure out what to do with it now. So th that's kind of where I am. Um, it's, it's definitely been shorter than two weeks, but you know, I was kind of in a very listless state. Like, I was so listless and depressive that one time while I was at work, I was just moping and just kind of going through the motions automatically. And then this um, person drives up next to me. I had my eyes on him the whole time, you know. And working on automatic doesn't mean that I'm not paying attention to my surroundings. You work in third shift, you work in a dangerous part of the neighborhood. Eyes up on a swivel or you're going to get a bullet. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't really realize how... Um, listless I had become until this person drove up behind me. And I was just kind of changing a garbage bag, going to the motions, just being mopey. And then he kind of walks up and he says, hey, buddy, you know, is like, who do you work for? Because your truck is in really nice shape. And we kind of got into a conversation um, about what I did for a living, which is just street sweeping. And he, I was asking, you know, what kind of companies around hiring because he wanted to he wanted to work for another street sweeper. And I pointed him in the general direction of of the, of the city um, that was looking for street sweepers and whatnot. And as he drove away, I blinked for a moment and I had to take a personal inventory of myself because for some reason, just after that interaction, I didn't feel like. Uh, you know, as depressive and mopey as I had been for the rest of that night, I felt kind of energized and awake. And I'm sitting there like, did I just get distracted out of my funk by, you know, talking to somebody? It wasn't even about my personal issues. It, it was just a, a random conversation out of nowhere. It felt like I got shocked out of whatever funk I was in um, just because someone came up and talked to me. And it didn't. it wasn't even related to what I was moping about. Which, it was kind of an interesting revelation, to, to be honest. Um, just when, you know, when, when you're, you're so depressed that when even just a random conversation that has nothing to do with how you're feeling kind of shocks you out of that depression, it, it's, it's, it's a real curious phenomenon. I'm not even really sure what to make of it, but it, it was just interesting. Uh, and anyway, and again, getting back to this article in question, you know, it, it basically says, oh, you just need to complain, let it all out and yada, yada, yada. It's like, well, you know, somebody who is <laughs> who would consider themselves an alpha channel be like, right, you know, the problem, what are you going to do about it? And I think that's kind of where I am. And I'm trying to uh, grapple with that question because I still feel a sense of helplessness about the whole thing. Like, I know what the issue is. I just don't know how to solve it. Uh, you know, it, it's how do I fix it? You know, obviously, I want to fix it so I can stop feeling like a fucking uh, piece of shit that has no bearing uh, or aim in life. But, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Like, another part of that is I, I think this... Um, this wound is even directly a result of why I uh, failed in the relationship I was in and why I can't seem to attract a mate this time around either. It goes that fucking deep.
but unless, you know, I fix it, <laughs> you know, sing it forever alone, ha hashtag forever alone. <laughs> it is what it is. So that, that, that's where it came from. You know, I, I read the article and I thought, you know, there, maybe there's some good nuggets in here. Um, but, you know, it's, some of it is kind of questionable. And then I started clicking on some of the other shit because I saw the fucking buzzwords. And <sighs> that's when I realized that I had just stumbled into a den of vipers. <laughs> It's like I had somehow unwittingly uh, stumbled into a collectivist safe space and started really paying attention to the website, and I realized that this is not, you know, the name's a misnomer. It says the Good Men Project. It's more like the Feminized Men Project. Some of the stuff I was looking into here, uh, let's see, this one article then with you too. If you don't see race, you're paying attention, and I'm kind of in the middle of reading this, but it... The, the author starts talking about, you know, they're tired of seeing the words race and whatnot, and they're talking about, oh, you know, there's racism and everything, and you don't have to be like, um, like, you don't have to be the, uh, the you know, uh, bad attitude, uh, crotchety old racist to be racist, annoying, and hurtful, and, 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 and just stuff like this one. And the more I'm reading it, uh, it just, the more... Um, the more I start to realize that this is not a reference that anybody should really be using for anything. <laughs> uh, I'm even looking through this one here. Don't use your color blindness to deny your privilege and ignore the things that hurt to recognize. Let inequality go unchecked or ignore the place that race is shaping our identities. As a matter of fact, letting go of the assumption that seeing race is a bad thing. Just because the first family is black doesn't mean racism is over and we all get our rose-colored glasses and make everyone... <laughs> Let's see, we see race for what it is. A very neutral but real thing that holds way too much power in this and act... Like, Jesus fucking Christ. The more you talk, the more I am convinced that pointing... It says, pointing out racism is not a witch hunt or an attempt to make you feel bad. The more you talk, sweetheart, the more uh, the more hypocritical you sound. The more it feels like, you know, you're not coming from a genuine place. Another one here. Um, it's basically, it's like, why we, you cannot discuss racism, uh, white fragility, why it's so hard to talk about racism, and the few things they listed here. Number two was particularly interested. So let's see, there's some of the challenges in here. Suggesting that a white person's viewpoint comes from a racialized frame of reference, which is a challenge to activity. Uh, people talking directly about their own racial perspectives, a challenge to white taboos. On t See, this, this, this is kind of retarded <sighs> it's interesting because the way I think that the author is supposedly framing this particular one the people of color talking directly about their own racial perspectives a challenge to white taboos on talking about openly and race when they say stuff like that it, it sounds like what they're doing is they're trying to generalize whites as not being uh, open to talking about race itself. This this feels very disingenuous. Because I don't mind, you know, if people want to talk about things about their own racial perspective. If you're talking about a racial perspective, you're talking about your own perspective and you're coloring your opinion uh, through the lens of race. Which... It's not a taboo, but it is something that, you know, I'm going to take with a grain of salt. If you're, if you're trying to do it in a way that, you know, makes things sound collectivized, you know, I, it, it probably sounds like, like I'm giving credit to this article specifically because I'm trying to work my way through it here and I don't have, like, a ready-made snap to uh, answer for this stuff. But part of it is is because I have to interpret the jargon 
that you're spewing and kind of follow it through. I, I, I talked about it in the video um, about mental gymnastics and everything else um, when I encountered some of the mitwits in the wild there. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's really weird. Yeah, it, it sounds like, it, well, again, what this really sounds like, and it's saying that white people do not like being, you know, talking about race openly. And when you say stuff like that, that just, you know, it, it, it does kind of fritz my brain. You know, and people may lend that and say, oh, white fragility, white fragility, white fragility. And it's like, no, I'm open to you talking about your perspectives. But if you color it to the lens of uh, racial perspective, again, I don't mind talking about it, but it's a thing that I'm going to take with a grain of salt. Because, again, how do, because then this, because even then I, you know, I'm going to, I can hold up a mirror to this and I can say, all right. Are you talking about it with the color of lens of race because you think um, the other people are judging you on the basis of race? Or are they actually judging you as a person? Okay, there we go. That's why my brain is fritzing. And because I'm holding a mirror up to – I'm subconsciously holding a mirror up to this, and it's not holding up when I do that. <clears throat> See, I'm always open to talking about people's perspectives, but when you when you try to frame it through the lens, one thing you have to keep in mind is that, you know, um, are your experiences because of this lens that you have chosen to view, you personally have chosen to interpret it through, uh, versus what is actually being said. This goes back to what I've always postulated um, from communication. There is what you say and what I hear and then what I say and what you hear. Like, I may say something, you know, to a black person and it may, I, what I'm, the message I'm trying to get across is more indicative of their personality. Not their race, their, per, their, their personality. But when the black person hears it, for some reason, they're not hearing me say um, you know, like I, I am saying this about you based on your personality. It's they're interpreting it as uh, I am saying this based on your race. So then they go, they go around, they they they, to, ah, they turn around and they talk about it to somebody else, and they say, "Well, he said this because I'm black." You know, and then when somebody comes to me later, it's like, "Oh, you're a fucking racist." I, you know, I'll kind of have a WTF moment and be like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And they say, "Well, you said this to about him, and that means you're racist because you said it against the black." I said, and I'll come back with, "No, that's not what I meant at all." And it, it, it's not going to register with the person accusing me of racism because they're so deeply entrenched in that um, ideology. You know, uh, let's see, people of color choosing not to protect the racial feelings of white people in regards to race, challenge for white racial expectations and need to entitlement. I do not need people to fucking coddle me because I'm fucking white. Jesus Christ. I understand that the fucking, you know, that Anglos, uh, you know, my skin tone are not you know, good people. We have our we have our bad people as well as our good people, and I'm willing to call out the bad actors. Are blacks willing to call out the bad actors? So that, that's the interesting thing right there. You don't need to protect my feelings. And it's like people of color choosing not to protect the racial feelings in regards to, you know, the right race. I don't need a POC to protect my feelings. The day I do is, you know, something has gone seriously wrong in that case. Uh, people of color not being willing to tell their stories or answer questions about racial experience. Again, you know, got to hold up the mirror. It's like, are you actually, it, it, was it actually a thing there? Or are you just putting the lens on it because that's how you feel? A fellow white not providing agreement with one's racial perspective. <sighs> I don't care. I don't need my feelings protected by another white person either. Receiving feedback that one's behavior had a racist impact, challenge to white racial. 
Okay, see this, again, this is kind of getting into the, do this, suggesting that group membership is insufficient, challenged individualism. I don't, I, I don't get that one. All right. An acknowledgement that access is unequal between racial groups, challenged to meritocracy. See, this sounds like fucking B BS that a grifter would spill. Now, this kind of chattels back towards uh, the, the video on Malcolm X where we sit down and we kind of listen to that speech. Um, you know, listening through it, he does make some good points. But while I'm sitting there and listening to it and I'm hearing the, uh, the roar of the background crowd, the more I'm sitting there like, you know... He's intentionally riling up this crowd uh, to agree with him that uh, blacks are treated badly specifically so he can rile them up and send them against his enemies. Uh, and that's kind of the sense I'm getting from this one article as well. You know, this, you've got people putting out in this, this story, propagating the story that access to stuff is unequal because of race. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's not meritocracy, like the whole diversity and initiative, um, in initiative, <laughs> diversity and in inclusion initiative is based on the story that people are not hired. Um, you know, that people are specifically hired or not hired based on race. And, oh, Jesus. Fuck. I, I just saw this other article. The trauma anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers are inflicting on... Jesus, fuck. Yeah, I have really stumbled into a den of hive and villainy. <laughs> Let's see. Not encountering these challenges, we withdraw, defend, cry, and push back uh, in New Grimm. They call that pushback white fragility. See... The way they, they word this article, and this is especially true when you reach the, the comment section down here at the bottom, uh, there's this one guy that just goes on and screams, White fragility! Every time somebody says, you know, I don't agree with the article. Oh, God. What, what's this one? Whites are taught to see themselves as individuals as rather part than a racial group. Individual enables us to deny that racism is a structure into the fabric of society. And races history and hides the way in which wealth is accumulated over generations and benefits us as a group today. Let us distance ourselves from history and actions of the group. Thus we get very irate when we are accused of racism because individuals we are different from other white people and expect to be seen as we find into Oy vey. See this is just an attack on individualism as a whole. This is the whole back and forth of individualism versus collectivism. And when you attack, you know, stuff like that, that's what this article is doing. Is that it basically attacks individualism by saying that individuals, uh, pe you know, people who believe that we should be judged as individuals and not as a collective are bad. Let's see, entitlement, uh, racial arrogance. Most whites have very limited understanding of racism because we have been, not been trained to think in complex ways about it and because it benefits white dominance not to do so. <laughs> ah. Oh, here's the here's a good one. Let's see, racial belonging. White people and the white people enjoy a deeply internalized, largely unconscious sense of racial belonging in the United States society. Uh, deemed valuable or whites belong. The interruption in racial belongings is rare and thus destabilizing and frights us. See, this is fucking hilarious. It's like the reasons why they're trying to bring, you know, representation into media and whatnot is because of this thing right here. It's a, it's a, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because, you know, I've seen blacks have good representation in media and entertainment before. Like, if you actually go into the comics, if you go into the movies, and you look back, and you actually go back um, in time, you can see plenty of representation everywhere in, in the good, in, you know, before all this woke bullshit. And it kind of goes back to something that uh, Tom and the rest of the boys and were, were discussing about how... Um, racial tensions being inflamed today has more to do with um, the 
the children of mixed parentage not feeling like they belong to one side or another. It's like, you know, the in, it, it, racial belonging kind of like goes into that whole thing where they're apparently talking about, uh, you know, we need more representation in media because everything is like dominated by whites, which is fucking hilarious because when you look back to, you know, if you actually look back, it, it's like these people don't believe that the world existed before like 2010. It's like there what it's like before there was nothing and then there was the world at 2010 and then that's it. They haven't looked back far enough. And when they do look back it kind of disproves this whole narrative. Psychic freedom. <laughs> this allows whites to <laughs> much more psychological to devote to other issues and prevent us. Yes, can we please move on from the race issue? We solved this long ago. But y'all keep trying to bring it up when we got other shit we need to be solving. I The antidote on white fragility is ongoing and lifelong, and this includes sustained engagement, humility, and education. So what you're saying here, uh, sweetheart, is basically what you're telling me is that because I was born white, I have white fragility, and I will never be cured of it or my privilege. I just have to, you know, kill myself and die. Wow. I, that's just... the. Y I read through this, and this really sounds like a fucking racist. <laughs> it itself. Fucking me, man. I'm, I'm not really going to go too much into this because, my God, how far have we fallen? Like, this is just grifting at this point. <laughs> uh. Right. Eh. Eh. Really, kind of not much, much more on it. I, I, I find, I find this whole thing um, just bizarre. Like the stories that they have to concoct just to get their narrative um, rolling property pro properly. Blah. Yeah, it's like almost four o'clock. <laughs> so. I'm awake, but I'm definitely not, uh, I'm definitely kind of slurring my words here a little bit. <laughs> um, it it kind of goes back to what I was talking about, mental gymnastics and the like, and just how much they had kind of have to twist that. It was also interesting, because we were going over um, chapter 9 of... Um, uh, the open letter to a progressive. Maybe I'll just kind of read through it, and we can, uh, you know, and uh, maybe I'll do my own kind of personal in-depth analysis on that one as well. But uh, it, it was partially interesting because what Chapter Nine kind of went into a lot was basically it was how to kill the establishment. And it basically told, you know, the open-minded progressive, it's like, look, if, if you can't handle the idea of killing a system uh, that you are in charge of, uh, you know, just put on these special lenses and flip everything to, um, to religious, conservative, religious fundamentalism and, you know, just believe that you are uh, saving the government from Jesus. <laughs> But what's interesting is that he goes it, it, it goes on to kind of talk about the same thing here. And it, it was something that I really kind of found semi-fascinating. 
was um, no, there was an example of uh, the, 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 the pill here. Now let me let me see if I can find it because it was it was questioning. Um, oh shit, that's the wrong chapter I was looking at here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I was looking at one of the old ones. All right, so it was an interview between uh, Dr. Watson and Professor Gates, and he manages to get Professor Gates um, to kind of swallow this this one, uh, basically take the red pill, so to speak. Um. When the question was asked was, but imagine if you were an African or an African-American intellectual, and it's 10 years from now, and you pick up the New York Times, and some geneticist says that A, gene uh, intelligence is genetic, and B, the difference is measured on standardized test uh, between black people and white people, um, is the, the difference between these two is traceable to a genetic basis. What would you, as a black intellectual, do you think? And I guess what what he's getting at there is, is um, alluding to <clears throat> some of the studies that have been done in the past that says that um, you know IQ is genetic. Like Asians are predispositioned to have the highest IQ. Um, on the scale. Following that is the Anglo whites, and then it's 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 kind of a race to the bottom between um, the blacks and the Arabs. But the person we're talking to is a black intellectual, somebody who's probably you know done the brain work, exercised their brain to overcome that hurdle. <clears throat> and become uh, uh, basically a, a brain a, a brainy boy, and so he's basically somebody who has defeated um, this idea postulated by the establishment. Um, but he supports the establishment. What the establishment is saying that he cannot exist because he's um, he's black, therefore he's stupid. And uh, you know, it, it's the same kind of mental gymnastics that make you uh, that they kind of prop it up. And, and the letter kind of goes on to say, um, you know, talking about how it's not even a question of, of stuff that's uh, that's been doing it now. It's like the cathedral has been broadcasting uh, mendacity since 1924. Um, there was a part of it here that actually actually comes out, and it says, um, uh, straight out, you know, says it. Fuck, I'm tired. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, I, uh, I, I kind of forget. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know. It basically says that the cathedral, um, the establishment, needs to prop itself up on these lies. And, you know, if you tell a lie long enough and hard enough, it becomes the objective truth. But is it really a factual truth, or is it just a truth that everybody believes to be fact because everybody believes it? Like, is it something that if we were to actually put through the rigors of... Um, uh, of, of like a, um, a multi-layer testing phase, will it hold up? Like, for example, when the military commissions a new weapon, they have specific um, requirements for said weapon. Like, it has to be able to fire this many rounds without jamming up. It has to be able to, you know, be quickly reloaded and unloaded, it still has to work even when it's like filled with sand, grit, and all that, all that, all that other fun, all that other fun stuff, and uh, things like that. And in, in nature, uh, the weight, its portability, uh, you know, stuff like that. And it, go, it goes beyond that as well. Like when when we start talking like the um, the actual equipment in terms of the machines, like you know, tanks and stuff, like. There is a rigorous set of tests, and these tests are performed repeatedly 
to make sure that um, you know there is absolutely no deviation and that um, the the full limitations of these machines are understood because they have to go to war and the soldiers need to know that the equipment will function uh, as intended. Like there can be no real deviations in this one. So like they'll, no, oh, that actually reminds me uh, even, even better. Uh, if you have heard of the All Guardsman Party, it's basically a story about a guy who plays a Warhammer 40k tabletop. But there was um, this one adversary that our, our valiant um, Imperial Guardsman faced uh, was this one Inquisitor who made a deal with Chaos to screw his, uh, his, his, his luck meter. Basically, what happened was is that the most bullshit improbability thing that would happen would would happen like the guy was so fucking incredibly lucky it was like fucking um domino from deadpool 2 where you know the it, it, she didn't even have to try the the luck the world just conformed to her will <laughs> the same thing with this guy and part of uh in in when they had to uh defeat him in kind of that climactic battle um you know, one of, one of some of their tech guys, um, you know, got a bunch of rifles, sat down and just fired them endlessly, 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 just to make sure that, you know, the rifles could not be screwed with, um, to, you know, to cause misfires. Because that, that's what would happen, um, you know, when, when, they, when they tried to take down this luck guy, is that, you know, even if they had a dead... Um, a dead to rights shot like one one time you know they brought out the helicopter launched a missile at this guy and as luck would have it just before the missile reached him so they could you know ensure total annihilation by explosion a fucking pigeon just flew out of nowhere in front of the missile and took the shot <laughs> But yeah, and and, 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 and that, that was kind of um, kind of what they were doing is they had to kind of go through the rigors of uh, the testing it to make sure that the equipment would function even you know when the luck was screwed, and that's kind of again what you know the real life military equipment has to test like it it can it withstand uh, the test well yes it can all right good can it do it again, and when you um, when you put forward um, like the gymnastics uh, ideals that these people believe in uh, to that kind of repeated testing, will it get the same result? And is it the result they necessarily want? And that that's kind of the interesting thing is that when they come up with these uh, um, theories, you know, stuff like critical race theory, racism and whatnot, it's like, They'll test it repeatedly until they get um, an outcome they want. And then they'll say, okay, we're done. But that one outcome might be the only one of its kind. Like, you know, they tested the theory on it, and it didn't hold up. So they did it again. It didn't hold up. They did it again. It didn't hold up. And they just kept uh, brute forcing it until finally... They finally got the result they were looking for. And they said, okay, we got what we were looking for, therefore this must be good and true. Whereas if you were to look at it from a more realistic perspective, um, the result they wanted was like 0.01% out of 99.99, .99, which by any, any true measure of the scientific method, that's an abysmal failure. Like, if you were to take kind of an ideal, apply that to a gun, hand it to me, and then tell me to go to a war zone, I'd tell me, I, I'd look at you and go, are you fucking insane? I'd rather sneak up on a motherfucker and knife him to death. Because I can at least trust that a knife isn't going to jam on every shot. <laughs> uh yeah, okay, I, I know how I'm kind of rambling here, but uh, I, I, I just kind of had to bring that up because I needed to get those tabs off my browser, and hopefully y'all got kind of a good laugh out of this. And I, I think we kind of um, 
we kind of learned a few things today uh, in regards to how they kind of try and shape the narrative. Because one thing that really kind of grinds my gears, and I talked about this um, when I basically opened a shotgun blast on the entire RubyTuber community, was uh, communication is important. But when you start twisting these words around, you start twisting ideals and concepts around, and they do this intentionally so they can... Um, you know, own you when they when they're trying to basically um, confuse you with science. As the song goes, she blinded me with science in in in, in that sense. That's what they're trying to do, and the, the best way to do that is to confuse and bewilder you with language that you cannot comprehend. Like y'all probably saw me stumbling through that um, article earlier in the moment because I was trying to parse through on why I could, you know, why something was off about that one statement. That's the language. And I fucking hate that. I, I hate when people twist the language like that because you can't communicate properly. And when you can't communicate properly, um, you, you can't have proper discourse. And I think that's why uh, the, the collectivists fail so much when you try to pin them down and kind of really get at what what they're trying to talk about because they don't want you to they don't want you to get it they want you to be stupid and ignorant forever so that they can always make themselves look smarter and intellectuals because you know whenever i run across somebody who's is being that kind of um retarded i like to call them out on that and part of that involves me Going in to pin them to the wall, and, you know, nail them down, and really understand why it is, you know, what what their point is, and they keep squirming. And they, I call it weaseling because that's what they do. It's like you know, I've got them pinned up against the wall. I've got them almost nailed down. It's like I'm holding them against the wall. I've got the nail gun, and I'm trying to pin them to the wall here and nail them down. But they keep squirming. They keep trying to weasel their way out. So we never get anywhere because they keep constantly trying to squirm and writhe and twist until they can find some way to not only beat me but look good to the audience as well. And because they won't sit down and commit, uh, I, 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 again, I, I cannot take them seriously. You know, and I think that's kind of where I'm going with this. Or maybe I am just screaming into the void. <laughs>